welcome back to Bumblebee, everyone. I hope you're ready to hit the dusty trail since we're checking out the top 10 bizarre Wild West laws that shaped history. Hold on, though. There was no law. That's right. How do you do a video on law when there was nothing written or upheld? After all, Constitution did not apply to unincorporated areas of the United States. The Code of the West by Zane Gray, published in 1932, revealed to us many of the unwritten rules of the West that had centered on hospitality, fair play, loyalty, and respect for the land found in the 20 years that the Wild West existed. Ramon Adams, a Western historian, explained it best, saying that back in the days when the cowman with his herds made a new frontier, there was no law on the range. Lack of written law made it necessary for him to frame some of his own, thus developing a rule of behavior which became known as the Code of the West. These homespun laws, being merely a gentleman's agreement to a certain rules of conduct for survival, were never written into statutes, but were respected everywhere on the range. The Wild West didn't have the judicial infrastructure we have now, with extensive police forces and crime labs and so on, owing to the vast side of, of counties and territories, both of which had their own law officers, and the fact that the officers from one jurisdiction had no authority in another, many of the crimes were handled on a citizen basis as Ramon described. So a respected authority would act as judge, a jury would be made, and a case would be determined off of witness testimonies. While their world was lawless, their job was nothing but OSHA and health and safety. The cowboy code. Yes, yes, it's not a law, but to cowboys in a time where there was no law, you either followed the generalized cowboy's code I'm about to share with you, or you weren't a cowboy, just a jackass on a horse. These cowboy laws existed then, and they still exist strongly today. So for all my frat dudes suddenly donning Carhartt, sideburns, and crap kickers because of the western fashion trends coming back in, I hope you're up to snuff with these cowboy expectations. Like for no matter how weary or hungry you are after a long day in the saddle, you always tend your horse's needs before your own, and you get your horse some feed before you eat. Taking care of one's horse is a core principle of horsemanship. Hey, a grain of water come before beans, biscuits, and coffee. Consideration for others is central to the code, such as don't stir up dust around a cock wagon, don't wake up the wrong man for her duty, etc, etc. Thou shall not steal was written in stone, and cowboys tend to honor this biblical principle with conviction. It goes beyond rustling calves, swiping the boss's money belt, or liberating a man of his prized saddle. Borrowing somebody else's belongings or riding their horse without permission is not allowed. Even invading their space is generally viewed as a form of larceny. On ranches where I've worked, nobody used your stuff, said Roland Moore, a veteran Montana cowboy in a 2015 interview. Your stall in the stable was always yours. The cookhouse was a safe place, so much that you could leave your money on the table and it would be there days later. And at dinner, your spot at the table always belonged to you. That's just the way it is. And on the topic of cowboys, how about the horse and cattle hustling, the then and versus now? Back in the 1800s, the report of a Texas Ranger captain on patrol with his company in the Texas Hill County Red came upon four cattle rustlers and four heads of stolen cattle. Final cost to state, six rounds. The penalty for cattle rustling and horse theft was always death if caught red handed. No need for trial, all that was necessary was to carry out punishment. Vultures and coyotes did the cleanup. Hell, in the cowboy code I just told you guys about, it states that riding another man's horse without permission is nearly as bad as spending a night with his wife. Nowadays, charges for horses or cattle rustling still exist. In April of 2021, the RCMP executed a search warrant on a rural property in central Alberta after an investigation was launched into stolen livestock from the Caroline area. Four stolen calves were located on the property, so the landowner was hit with five counts of theft. Also, I guess he must have been a character from Trailer Park Boys because he happened to have a stolen vehicle, multiple illegal weapons, was under the influence while driving, had a bunch of substance in the vehicle, and 12 catalytic converters. So police solved a couple other crimes in this trip. And in 2009, Bill SB 1163 was passed by Texas Senate to increase the penalty for cattle theft in Texas to 30 degree felony to dissuade the excess issue. Montana's Senate Bill 214 also passed in 2009 and it required a person convicted of theft or illegal branding of any livestock to pay a minimum fine of $5,000 and not exceeding $50,000 and serve a jail sentence not exceeding 10 years. Whether illegal hustling or a cowboy leading the way, remember, no shortcuts. Long distance cattle driving was a tradition in Mexico, California, and Texas and represented a compromise between the desire to get cattle to the market as quickly as possible, but also need to maintain the animals at a marketable weight. While the cattle could be driven as far as 25 miles in a single day, they would lose so much weight that they'd be hard to sell when they reached the end of the trail. However, sometimes shortcuts could be made, literally and figuratively. Cowboys sometimes were paid to sabotage a cattle drive or steal cattle. Sometimes they swindled cattle owners or stole the cattle themselves. Sometimes cutting through a path of land could get you somewhere faster. In these cases, it was accidental, but for many, the train and their tracks were the perfect for ridding themselves of cows. As a result,
result of this behavior. Nowadays, a modern livestock code in Montana state legislature prohibits driving animals upon a railroad track. If a person willfully drives an animal onto the railroad track with intent to injure the corporation or the persons owning the railroad or animals, and such animal is killed or injured thereby, the person is punished by a fine not exceeding $50,000 or imprisonment in state prison not exceeding five years, or both, and they're liable for all injury and damage as caused by this occasion. A break from the animal talk will cover the West and women's suffrage. How a lack of laws in the West made it possible to limit oppressive laws against women in the East and America wide. The frontier lands weren't bound by the conventions of the eastern parts of the United States. Past the continual divide, people were expected to dispense their own justice within communities. This also meant people were no longer bound by day to day conventions of life in established towns and cities elsewhere. And by people, I mean women. Well, predominantly white women, at least, it's always being the easiest for them. Women could own property, they could work as painted ladies or as madams, but they could also be law enforcement, bounty hunters, and business owners. They could have their own home, they could divorce, or they could cross dress their way through life, the way that Charlie Parkhurst did. The origins of the women's suffrage movement in America began in the West. Virtually all of the western states enfranchised women long before the states in the east granted women the vote. Women's Christian Temperance Union was a huge leader in the women's rights across a variety of cultural, political, and social divides, leaning towards socialism and its belief that women needed legal rights in order to best fulfill their roles in home and beyond. Members of the WCTU as well as Women of the Wild West worked together to campaign for better working conditions, equal pay, voting rights, and end the exploitation of women. The work of the WCTU and the experiences of these Wild West women, especially indigenous women and women of color who suffered the worst at the hands of white settlers and worked the hardest despite, are important and led to the freedoms that we have now. And now a silly little interlude, the measure of a man should not be his ability to toss back some beers. After all, what constituted a man being old enough to belly up to the bar in the Wild West? Usually it was the judgment of the proprietor or the bartender. You guys know the one where they kind of look at you and they do the up and the down and the, you get all anxious. Billy the Kid was hanging out in saloons by the time he was 18. Billy Clanton was doing the same even before that. There are endless records of our most famous cowboys and outlaws getting tanked on the regular from a young age. But why? First off, alcohol was more common because it was a lot safer than water. Alcoholic drinks kept longer and it was easier to transport. It's been this way since medieval times, so no shock value in that. Beer was rocking a typical 1-2% to ABV, and it was the closest thing to portable water. When they were actually drinking to drink though, spirits was the choice coming in at about 15% ABV in the late 18th century compared to our modern day 40% ABV. Uh, one other thing, oh yeah, youth having a struggle or having exposure to alcohol was a big reason that prohibition was finally approved. You know how a bunch of women were upset that their husbands came home drunk every day and that's how prohibition got its ball rolling? Well the men grew up in this era, or at least their fathers and grandfathers did, and as we know addiction is not only a but a genetic one, so even if they didn't partake themselves at a young age, their parents might have. This intergenerational trauma was inflicted by excess alcohol consumption in the Wild West and survived well into the more smoke and factories prohibition era. And let's talk about the law of the wanted poster, dead or alive. That can't be literal or real, right? Could you actually kill someone legally as long as it was a government poster with a cheeky red stamp on it? To answer your first question, yes, there are many known instances such as dead or alive posters being put up by the state or other entities, but it wasn't a get out of jail free card to kill the person without legal consequences. For example, Jesse James his death. Charlie and Robert Ford kill him, their own pal, but they went to collect the bounty and were jailed and put to death because witness testimony stated Jesse was unarmed, not resisting, and willing to go with them. To get away with killing a wanted person, they needed to be resisting in some kind of way, particularly in a way that threatened your life, aka self-defense, which wouldn't have been any different than if somebody attacked you outside of a bounty scenario. For quite some time in the US history, it was legal to use a deadly force against a fleeing felon, even if your own life wasn't immediately threatened. The logic behind this was seemingly that chasing down a fleeing person could be dangerous in unforeseen ways. It also incentivized criminals not to flee in the first place. These wanted posters still exist today and are used by associations such as the Mounties or the FBI or even the Supreme Court. A wanted poster can be a very important tool in seeking a fugitive. It allows law enforcement to make the public aware of a wanted person, multiplying the number of eyes focused on finding them. How do you get rid of indigenous people and pull tourists? Bison extermination mandates. Just to try and imagine the old west with no billboards, no power lines, fresh clean air open fields, nothing in the way of massive herds of bison. If there's anything to be said about the Americas, it's when we ruin something, we ruin it in full 
force. Bison, with an estimating range of 10 to 30 million, roamed America in the early 1800s. Then the Pacific Railroad was completed that opened up the West to a whole different kind of person, who were adventurous but still wanted to sit in a comfortable chair the whole time. Railroads would advertise hunting excursions in which paying customers would climb atop the train cars and aim down at the bison running alongside the tracks. No work involved, no danger for themselves, and hundreds of thousands of bison corpses are left to rot where they fall. One disgusting pig of a man or Orlando Brick Bond is credited with killing thousands himself. But the truth is most of them were killed by the people commissioned by the United States Army or the Army itself on their orders to do so. The American buffalo was a primary source of food and hide for indigenous people and the United States wanted to wipe us out. So they went after the buffalo in the 1830s and by the early 1900s there's less than a thousand left. Kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo is a dead Indian gone, one colonel said during a hunting expedition. The policy was if you saw a buffalo as a soldier you were obliged to kill it. And now for how the West brought us the misfortune of botch, rinse, then reform. A death sentence is something most of us won't have to face in our lifetime, if you're lucky or not a terrible person at least. And a botched death sentence occurs when there's a breakdown in protocol. And that involves an unanticipated problems or delays that cause, or at least arguably cause, unnecessary pain for the prisoner or that reflect just gross incompetence of the executioner. It's an estimated that 3% of the US death sentences from 1890 to 2010 are botched, with the hemp necktie coming in at first. The tension of the rope or the strength is right. They were using a generalized scale that resulted in some hellish endings. The death of Tom Horn was retold in the saga of Tom Horn and he was sentenced to death but the method used to relieve him ended up with him suffocating for 17 minutes. The opposite happened to Black Jack aka Tom Ketchum, the last man to be roped for train robbery. He fell too far ending his life with decapitation. The New York Times says a reliable formula for determining the drop wasn't published till 19 and with it came more humane standards for pre-death sentence and the wild west is actually the origin of prisoners getting to choose their last meal as well. And finally, no deathly duels is last in the countdown. Public offender, legislator, lawyer. Each of these professions needs to take an oath stating that they have never fought a duel with a deadly weapon if they want to work their job. In section 228 of the state's constitution there remains a famous dueling clause. Since 1891 the commonwealth officials have had to swear or affirm that they've never been in a duel in or out of the state or or acted as a sect. Now why do we have that law still today? Well in 1777 a group of Irishmen decided that the various rules and regulation of dueling published in European novels should be brought together in an updated manual, Code Duello. Featuring 26 rules for civilized duels, America won its independence from Great Britain in 1783. The newly reformed United States took a dim view on dueling. George Washington abhorred the practice. Benjamin Franklin said duels constituted as a horrible practice, but that didn't stop anyone. Button Gwinnett, who signed the Declaration of Independence died in 1777 from a duel, and Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers, died in a duel. By the first decades of the 19th century, dueling increased among the American upper classes. A new, more American version of the Code Duello, written by a Southern Carolina governor, Lyde Wilson, appeared in 1838. Knowledge of the code became part of the fashionable young gentleman's life, and with such history of, of glorification of weapons, it's no wonder that the state's fourth and present constitution retained the seemingly archaic clause again against dueling. Kentucky lawmakers felt that an official statement in the Commonwealth's highest legal document banning would-be elected officials from participating in duels would send a powerful message to those who might still resort to violence to settle disputes. Alright alright, thank you so much for tuning in, I hope you enjoyed and be sure to like and subscribe to see more from us.